Welcome. Welcome, Jean-Marc. We, we're very happy to um, have you been looking forward to this conversation. I'll start with a quick intro to just to uh, get it out of the way. So you are, um, you work with ThoughtWorks as the Director of Emerging Technologies in North America with a focus on distributed systems and data architecture. You have a, a deep passion for decentralized technology solutions, and you have founded the concept of Data Mesh, which is what we're going to talk about today. You are a member of uh, the ThoughtWorks Technology Advisory Board and contributed to the creation of ThoughtWorks Technology Radar. Uh, you have worked as a software engineer and an architect for over 20 years and have contributed to multiple patents in distributed com computing communications as well as embedded device technologies. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Matt. So you, you caused uh, quite a stir with this uh, data mesh uh, concept, um, you know, within the admittedly small circle of, uh, you know, data geeks, uh, in, including people on Twitter that have been like uh, tweeting back and forth about, okay, what does that all mean? What are the consequences? What does it mean for my company? What does it mean for my customers? Um, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited to dive into all of this. And maybe let's start at the highest uh, possible, possible level. What is the problem uh, you are trying to solve with this? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think the, the angle to take in terms of problem, we need to, it, it tries to get, data mesh tries to enable organizations to get value from their data with their analytics and ML solutions under a completely new world order, uh, which is where we are right now, right? Uh, what do I mean by a new world order? I mean, um, you know, in an organization where complexity is the norm and complexity of organization in terms of where the data can get generated, how the data can get used, um, comp organizational complexity where growth is constant, change is constant, merger acquisition happens, you're constantly dealing with new types of data, new source of data. Uh, and aspirations, the, the new world order in terms of new aspirations is how we want to use the data. We've moved away from, okay, I'm going to run a few set of a warehouse and get a few reports and get an insight into the operation of my organizations to uh, actually, I want to run, you know, include ML, a data-driven way of uh, solving problems into every feature of my application. So I mean, just look at Zoom or look at Spotify or any applications that we use daily has an ML embedded into it. So under this new world order, where complexity is norm, where, when con constant change is norm, when growth is norm, data mesh tries to solve the problem of getting value while dealing with, while embracing this complexity. Yeah. There's no lack of tools and platforms and, and, and solutions to try and tackle this whole complexity. So what, what is the industry currently doing wrong uh, that, uh, you know, needs to be improved? Yeah, I mean, you're right. Uh, I think at the industry, when I actually I use uh, one of your publications where you put the landscape of all this data thing, and I feel kind of dizzy uh, when I look at it, um, it's almost unreadable. And so I do agree that what we have done right up to now is a lot of innovation in the bottom layer of kind of our stack. If you think about our technology stacks where the data-driven organizations and consumers sit at the top and the machines sit at the bottom, we've been building a lot of technologies kind of try to re solve really hard low-level problems, the problems of data processing at scale or data storage at scale and distributed kind of computing and storage at the, at the bottom layer, and that's great. What we've got wrong is a set of technologies that scale out nicely um, with the organization, with the growth of organizations. So what we haven't got right so far, I mean, what we've built, I suppose, has led to, um, I don't know if actually what comes first, whether the organization comes first or technology comes first, but what we've built is suitable for organizations that are functionally divided, you know, you run your business in one side and then you deal with the data in the other side. So you put a wall between what's data driven and what's not data driven. So I think that functional separation, what we've built has led or has embraced kind of centralization, both from put the data on my, on my, on my platform so you get value from it or put the data in the warehouse and have some sort of a canonical model around it to get value from it or put it on the lake. So there's some sort of a centralization, both from the locality as well as kind of the organizational structure that deals with the data and maintains it. Um, so all of those kind of synchrony, points of synchronization, 
centralization of the data, centralization of the organization, functional division between the data and non-data, those are the things that have led to kind of a system that is fragile to scale and change at the macro level, not at the bits and bytes level, right? So, yes. yeah, so we've got, a, we've got a system that's fairly fragile to change and, to change and scale, and that's, that's what we've got to change. Okay, great. So what is it? What is the data mesh? You know, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak, because, uh, you know, again, like on Twitter, it's like, what does it what does it mean? And like somebody says something, somebody else says something, um, which I, I, I've loved the conversation, but I, I'm yeah. uh, very excited to hear it from you. Sure. I think uh, it's like an onion. We've got to kind of peel the layers. But um, when I started... I guess talking about it, I wanted to be very cognizant of the, uh, I guess, maturity of the idea, right? Uh, so I started with a set of principles, and I think I've talked about those principles uh, in many forums, and we can go over them very quickly. So I guess at the at the at a high level, it is a kind of a socio-technical approach in how we share and manage data for analytical use cases and socio-technical because we cannot just talk about technology without talking about people who will use the technology are subjected to the technology. So it's both an organizational structure, operational model within the organization as well as the technology in order that we can get value from data at scale for analytical use cases. So that's kind of a tagline. And then if we come layer the onion a little bit, the, the most fundamental underpinning principle around it is this idea of you can get to data, get value from it, connect it with other kind of data sources, no matter where the data lives and no matter who owns it. So it's counter to bring the data to one place on one team, on one model to get value from it. So underpinning that is this idea of decentralization of ownership and control. Uh, around the access of uh, business domains, that's the access within which an organization can grow. And that's an access around which we have actually aligned our technology, you know, services, operational services and business. So let's extend that, like with microservices, we did that, right, 10 years ago. Um, let's extend that idea with the fact that every business unit that's al and it's aligned technology, um, kind of organization and technology architecture, we can also align the data and data sharing. So it's, at core, it's that, basically. That's, that's, that's the idea. But when you actually peel it a little bit further, you go, holy crap, that can cause a ton of problem. If I just did that, if I end up with this silo of databases in all, all over the place, that's where we are today, right? That's why we try to kind of put everything in one nice, beautifully designed place. So then it follows with a few other principles in terms of how to address that concern of, of in, disconnectivity, lack of interoperability, and it introduces this concept of a data as a product, which is a foundational unit of data sharing. And it's very different from what we imagined what data is. And we can talk about that in a bit. Uh, it comes with the idea of um, uh, a new kind of platform and the next generation type of platforms that really enables this cross-functional teams to manage and share and consume data rather than data specialists. We move really towards the generalist um, satisfaction. Uh, and a new way of thinking about governance. So we're not compromising privacy or security or of those you know, higher objectives that the governance has, but we are realistic in how do we implement it in a very decentralized fashion. And if you peel those principles further, I think that's when I lose people. Like up to this point, people are kind of like, yeah, I get it, I like it, I wanna make friends with you. And you know, we can be all friends and talk about the same thing. But then once you actually go, in fact, how can you, have decentralization, have your data copied around and transformed if you need to, and yet be able to run these distributed analytical workloads, what does it actually take to do that? Um, then we get to the discussion of like those pieces of technology that needs to enable. And that's, that's yeah. what I think I, uh, how do you say, you, you lose friends and make enemies. <laughs> That's, that's where I guess uh, both of, a little bit of a di di confusion or lack, lack of agreement will happen because we have to make some um, compromises, I suppose, to get all of these other wonderful things that we have. Uh, and that's a discussion that I don't think we have really had so much. I, I'm reflecting on it in the book, but um, that's coming out later this year, but I don't think we have really talked about it. Okay, great. All right, so that, that's super interesting and makes a lot of sense. Um, indeed, I'd love to get into the next level of detail at, at the risk of possibly losing friends. 
uh, to understand what what that what how how that manifests exactly, right? Because so centralized a centralized data architecture and team, like everybody sort of understands, and that indeed has been the trend. Like you have a data science team or data analyst team, and they have like a you know a data warehouse, and they have like tools to put the data into the data warehouse, and then on the other side they have like tools to do analytics. Um, and this like you know chief data officer like so like people understand that as sort of the common thing. Uh, but what you're suggesting is radical decentralization of all of this. Uh, and I'm I'm very curious about what that how that manifests like data as a product is that like a is that like a, a, a unit of like data people and product and technologies for that product and then there's going to be like the next one and how do they communicate? You, you alluded to like a lot of this, but I'd love to get into the details. Sure, and it is, it is a long conversation, so I don't think there is one right place to start it from, but if we, if we start the conversation around what are the affordances or capabilities that we really want to provide at the end of the day, no matter it's centralized or decentralized, let's look at those and, and what we really want, what are, what are those affordances, and then let's go deeper and say how do we provide those affordances with this idea of decentralization, right? So one of those first Let's imagine the experience of a data scientist, like from a data scientist perspective or data consumer perspective. The first thing that they want, they do is a hypothesis. They have a hypothesis. Can I make, I don't know, recommendations around kind of playlists and music based on, on music profiling? And can I do music profiling based on the mention of the music in various blog posts and so on if I'm in a digital business, uh, you know, a streaming business? So starting from that hypothesis, what I need to be able to do is I need to be able to discover the data that I'm looking for, right? No matter whether that data actually physically is. So we need to have ways of uh, ability to discover the data, and hence it needs to have been registered with, with some way, address it, discover it, connect to it, uh, get to the output of that data or the, the actual data set itself, no matter who owns it and, and where it is. Uh, and then I need to, whether I'm a data scientist or data analyst, I need to be able to uh, use my native tools, what's, what's native to me to process that data. And I think this kind of funny war between warehouse and lake and what model we should access the data that, that seems to me a little bit irrelevant because both of those access models are very acceptable. So we need a new construct that provides data in multiple modes for a particular, let's say, social profiling of your music. You can access it uh, with native tools or native access model for data scientists as columnar files, or you can access the same data running some sort of algebraic query like SQL or uh, different types of queries. So then, so that's the next step. And then- uh, just, for, just for the, the step, yeah. so um, data discovery and access. So is there still a concept of like somewhere this uh, catalog or is that too much centralization if you say you have a catalog that that knows where all the data is distributed yeah so really good question i think all of the models so there is a concept of a discovery portal of some sort right i need to be able to see browse search right look for the data that i need but uh, when it comes to the next step of implementation of these affordances if we think about it as you know, data is this um, kind of piece of information without agency, without any computational ability, which is how we thought about data so far. The design we come up with is that there is a central catalog that will go and look for data in different places and add some metadata to it based on who accessed it and who used it. And it will create a catalog and it will constantly sync by searching this mess of a landscape that is. Um, and once we, while we need a discovery portal of some sort to search and browse, what Data Mesh introduces is, is this concept of a data quantum, actually rethinking data as a unit that not only constitutes the data, but it also constitutes all these computational affordances that gives that data agency and intention. What do I mean by that? So let's follow with that discovery example. As a, as a data product developer that I'm creating this new logical construct, I am in fact intentionally providing discoverability abilities in, in that unit. So I am providing a set of APIs that any search or browse utility can hook up to and get discoverability information about me 
and getting, and I intentionally, as that data quantum, I intentionally with agency provide that information. I'm not this dumb bits and bites sitting on this, I'm lively, I, I have, you know, a competition going on. So, uh, so then I will have APIs that provides, okay, what sort of guarantees I'm intentionally providing, what sort of model of the data I am exposing, uh, what are other guarantees in terms of like the timeliness, quality, completeness, all of those things. And I'm constantly computing these as I'm generating new data. So that, so it's, that sort of a, it's sort of part of my contract, right? I, I have my own data product, but like the, 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 the trade-off is like, I, I need to make it discoverable and, um, you know, uh, and, and it's still like anybody can access it. Like sort of, like, is there a concept of almost like SLA of, uh, hey, I'm like in charge of my data product. It needs to be discoverable, it needs to be up, it needs to be, um, you know, clean, it needs to be usable. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm, so this data product, if I, I, I use this idea of a data quantum as a logical counterpart for it, like this thing that you actually build. Uh, because data product can be applied to many different, but on the mesh, this logical uh, kind of unit, uh, absolutely, it will have uh, interfaces, APIs to provide your SLAs, uh, to provide also um, what it does, that logical unit, what it does is consumes data from somewhere else, it provides some operation on it, whether this operation was like NLP and discovering what was the you know social mission was actually saying about this track and do music profiling and then it, it does some sort of operation transformation and then it provides output and for each of those outputs it provides ancillary information to make that output actually understandable and then accessible in multi multiple modes but in addition to that this kind of data point on for it to be complete structurally complete because we're thinking about this decentralized model with the, we have a structurally complete units uh, that can provide value on their own there is another piece to it not just the data that it gets and the data provides and slos and discoverability apis but also the policies that govern it so we are in now we're bringing together policy that governs this data the data itself the transformation and code that keeps this data actually alive I mean, I can't really think of a data that is dormant. Any piece of data almost is continuously changing. Um, and the policy, yeah, and, and the code that keeps it alive and the policies that govern it. So that thing, if we put it, I usually put a hexagon around it. Uh, it's the idea that is really foundational to data mesh and it's kind of non-existent. Great. So to um, help continue bringing this home, like what, what does an implementation of it look like sort of practically? <sighs> This is why this I happens. Um, I have to be really honest with you. Um, at this point in time, it looks like a Frankenstein creation because uh, we have to stitch together a lot of technologies that exist and they weren't designed for this model of reconfiguring, you know, being reconfigured in this way. So what the foundational technologies that I have used so far are more or less the same. So for example, for your... Uh, input, what, what I call input ports, is in where the data actually is coming from that gets transformed. You still have your uh, ingestion mechanisms that exist today, whether you are hooking up to some upstream event stream or you're, you know, hooking up to some API to get the data. You're, you're doing CDC against some sort of a um, legacy system. So those ingestion mechanisms remain the same. Your transformation code that is encapsulated by this data quantum and does the transformation. Again, those are um, flow-based flow programming model that you have. So a lot of people still use a Spark or Beam or you know, whatever. And if you have very simplistic maybe transformation, you're running just a federated query and the output of that query is simply your transformation. So you have your usual suspects around transformation and um, code uh, work orchestration. And then on the, on the output side, you are providing uh, kind of a, a little bit of a high level APIs, whether it's REST or GraphQL, that really redirects you underneath to a multi, a polyglot, I guess, a storage of kind. Either it redirects you to uh, a lake storage, an object storage, or redirects you to um, a table in the warehouse, or you know, whatever storage is meaningful for that data product. And for all the discoverability stuff, uh, is additional code that you write. Um, I mean, this is, this is libraries that you develop as part of your project to standardize, okay, what, what metrics do I want to expose? And you will have, you know, um, code 
just handcrafted code for exposing um, those extra metrics. And if you want to, on top of it, at the mesh level, like kind of plug in kind of discoverability and catalog with some effort, maybe you'll be able to use existing ones, but maybe you end up writing a simple catalog on, the, uh, on, on top of it. So when you put all of this together, it actually looks pretty ugly because we are stitching technologies together in a new way that weren't designed to be stitched together this way. You, and you run into uh, limitations very quickly because nobody assumed that you will be sharding your storage accounts, you'll be sharding your computation based on these little data products and having hundreds of these, um, I don't know, lake storages. They assume maybe you have one, two, 10, 200, 128, something along those lines. So, uh, so you run into limitations. So I'm hoping that we can, uh, you know, we can move the technology needle forward as well. Yeah, so to, to this point, are, are there, um, can you build a data mesh with the existing tools? Like you, you mentioned, like some of the existing things like Apache Beam, Flow, like all, all those things. Um, uh, to be successful at drawing out a data mesh, does it mean that new tools need to be created, like new standards, uh, or can you make do with what we currently have? Yeah, I think uh, we have no choice but start with, like if you're starting today, like we started three years ago, we used a ton of stuff that already exists, but we also built a ton of stuff. I mean, I don't like to go to every client and say, look, this is great, you can use the technology that you already have, but you have to commit to this. Oh, Siri. Um, you have to commit to this two, three year kind of a program of building out capabilities in your platform that you just, just simply can't buy. So hopefully that we still have to uh, get the technology to fill the gaps and where those gaps are. Uh, to me, you know, a lot of it is around interoperability. We are, we have that wonderful diagram of tools that you have, uh, you know, in your, in your landscape, but we, if you, if you zoom in, the very few of tools that actually interoperate and play nicely with the, with the rest of the tools uh, and the standards that are yet to be created are around kind of the expression of um, uh, storage agnostic modeling of the data. So I, I talk about uh, in this data quantum, uh, how time access has to be a, a ever present um, parameter in the data sharing because the only way we can have our cake of distribution and copying data as you wish and have the and eat the oh, this this is going really bad the analogy of cake but what I'm trying to say is that the only way we can distribute data and yet have global consistency of the data no matter how the mesh is you know transforming the data we have to build in um, some really basic construct like by temporality immutability like these these constructs just yet don't exist. So have some sort of a temporal representation of data agnostic to serialization modeling. So there's the standards around data sharing, standards around um, uh, policy configuration, standards around access control. So access control right now is very proprietary in data world to the platform you're stuck in um, mm -hmm. compared to the API world where you have some sort of a you know, standard. So some of, some of those standard pieces need to come. Great. And maybe a last question from me because I want to then turn. We have actually a lot of questions in the chat. Um, so just so if you fast forward 10 years and like everything works out as planned, what, what does that look like in terms of, um, you know, the life of like developers and data scientists and how, how does that get changed? We all have a smile on our face <laughs> and have a lot of fun to do data work. So that's the first. First one, I think what I, what I, I mean, none of these, I mean, I'm looking at a bit of a crystal ball and what I have seen has happened in the past. So hopefully it makes sense to the audience. But I think one of the big changes would be we'll move from this specialized and specialization to generalization. So some of the things that we consider a specialization today, like data engineering, data, well, a large portion of what we call data science becomes basic engineering. So I think that's uh, that has to happen. Otherwise, we will never scale to this to meet the aspirations that we have. So, so move from specialization to generalization is one. I think we will rethink if data mesh happened. When we talk about data, we imagine something very different. We talk, we imagine this kind of lively 
ever-changing thing that has an agency to govern its policies and to uh, to keep the data alive and provide you know APIs. We, we don't think about it as a byproduct we dump somewhere and we build technology on top of it to get access to it. So I think I hope that our imagination around what constitutes data changes. Um, and you know we we really truly become data driven in a way that we can get access to data safely and securely, um, no matter where that data is and who owns that data, as long as, we, of course, we have the permission to, to access that data. And there is this, so there is no constant moving data from one platform to another platform it needs to happen. Platforms have opened up. And I think finally, there's a conversation that we haven't had and I haven't talked much about it is the, the sovereignty, right? The sovereignty of the data needs to be something that as a policy we need to build into the data to really give the control back to the real owners of the data right you and me and everybody else on this call so that gets baked in into that data quantum as a as a as a policy great all right that's fascinating uh i have a bunch of questions can we um try to do a few of those as rapid fire like i, I don't know how doable that is because some of those questions are very good and and maybe hard to answer quickly but let's try all right so question from Akil oh I chill I hope I pronounce um, your name correctly is there a recommended migration path from an enterprise data lake to a data mesh yeah, I think you uh, start going backward from your consumers of the data uh, data lake. So look at who's accessing it, why they're accessing it, what data do they need, work backward and go back to the source. So uh, go back to the source of the data, to those domains where they're generating the data, incentivize them so they're actually being incentivized to share that data. Use the lake technology still as an underpinning storage technology. Um, but remove it as an intermediary place to dump the data in, get the consumers directly consume the data from. And when I say the source, I don't mean the application database, I mean the data quantums of data products that you provide in addition or adjacent to as close to the source as possible. And if there are some intermediary kind of aggregate data products that you have to build to do that. So work backward from consumer and uh, discover the data products you need to build and incrementally build those data products owned by people that are most suitable to have the long-term ownership of that. And uh, they're, they, they're, they're part of the domains that actually um, that data comes from. Great question from Jacob around immutable data. So could you elaborate on how immutable data would be used for joining? Uh, if say a consumer wants to join with a current state of NT Tees. I'm reading the question. Are there patterns or resources that already exist that explain best practices dealing with immutable data? Yeah, I think this is a big conversation to have. The data can be only immutable if we build two time timestamps into every single if every single um, kind of representation of the data. And those two timestamps are when something actually happened and when we process that information, our understanding of the that data. That three pieces, like the actual data, the event or state at the time that it happened and the time that we processed it, that piece is immutable. And you can see any of those parameters can change. For example, as our understanding of the, let's say Matt and I talk to each other, we, we have this conversation and this, um, and you re, you view it tomorrow. So your, let's say your system is processing this video tomorrow. Uh, and let's say there was a mistake in that processing and you have to reprocess that video, maybe the transcript, you were processing the transcript and you have to reprocess the transcript because there was a mistake. So then what the new piece of data would be this video, uh, the new transcript that was happening happened at the same time today, but it was processed tomorrow, right? The next time. So, so that's what immutability really means in data mesh. Um, and you can always arrive at a state at a point in time or look at the differences between two points of time. If you want to join, you can always join across a point in time, across all of those data products. But as long as those timestamps are baked in, um, you can always um, do join as you wish. You can always say, just give me the join of my latest. Um, but it has to be built into every 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 data product. Um, and I think this is the one I have to go to a little bit of a, <laughs> not war, but a bit of a, 
I guess, um, conversation around how to really build it because there are not many technologies that think about data that way. And, I, and that has, in my mind, has led into a ton of accidental complexity that we deal with, with constantly updating the data once we've processed it. Great. Um... All right, there's, there's a bunch of um, very good questions and very thoughtful questions. We're sort of running out of time. Um, maybe I'll just ask the last one because um, I guess it opens the door to ways for people to learn more. So a question from, from David, as ThoughtWorks or others set out a program of work that lays out what needs to be done to have a reference implementation of a data platform or exemplar data product. So I guess, how do people... Uh, take the next step in terms of like learning and setting this up? Yeah, so in terms of learning, I mean, we're doing our best to uh, generate as much content as possible. So my my book is a piece of that. Uh, we are, when, when is the book coming out, by the way? Uh, <laughs> I, I keep doing it. So hopefully end of this year, the digital version, if we okay. just work very hard till December. Uh, but worst case, it would be early next year. Um, but the print will be early next year. Um, we're also trying to kind of extract some of the um, kind of the best practices, what we've learned at this point in time. Again, this is this is a fast evolving space. So uh, the reference implementation that we're hoping to put out again sometime in the next few months is going to be using the existing technology and tools to bring some of these paradigms to life. And I hope that that would be out of date the moment it's out, because I really like to see the technology moving faster and we use you know, new ways doing, doing that reference implementation. So uh, we will publish that uh, open source. Um, we'll have an open source reference implementation. So we're working on it internally. Great. All right. Well, this was fantastic. Um, and I'm, I'm just realizing we should probably have uh, done this as, a, as an hour long session because it, it feels like we're in some ways just scratching the surface um, and we have a lot of uh, good questions. We'll, we'll save those questions. Like, I don't know if there's a way to um, answer them offline, but we can figure that out. Um, in any case, I just wanted to say a big uh, thank you. This is a uh, super interesting uh, and feels like a glimpse into the future for you know our little uh, world of like data geeks and you know data infrastructure engineers analysts like all those folks um, so uh, you know thanks for pushing the thinking and very excited to see how that develops over the next uh, months and, and years thank you so much for having me thank you for those wonderful questions so we can hopefully find another venue to answer them Thank you, Jamak. We'll talk soon.